Good morning and welcome to our webinar for the INED community in the investment management sector. Uh, my name is Darren Griffin and I'm going to be your MC for this morning's session. Um, so you're all very welcome. We do have a uh, packed agenda for you this morning and some great speakers. Um, uh, we had some great speakers and um, we'll also give you an opportunity to to, to raise questions with the panel uh, at the end of the, the session. You do have a question functionality within within um, within the system we're using today so please feel free to to add your questions as we go through it and then I'll facilitate them with the with the panel at, at the end. Uh, so again thank you for joining us this morning and um, I'd now like to pass on to Brian Forrester our investment management lead within Deloitte and um, for some opening comments. Thank you very much. Thanks Darren. Um, yeah good morning everybody. Uh, it's a bit of a bit of an odd one actually to be um, to be sort of interacting with uh, with the community in this way um, but that's the way it is um, and you know I think when we talk about getting back to the, the normal what is normal anymore um, I, I think this is what we have uh, for a while and you know really for me uh, the, the take up for the session this morning has been incredibly strong um, I think that shows uh, both that the you know this way of interacting with you is is what people are, are comfortable with and, and also I think that the topics that we're going to be talking about today um, are of interest to you. Um, I think, you know, as the situation evolves, as people get used to working in the way that we are, that's one thing, but life goes on, regulations change, businesses have to operate in the new environment. And I think it's it's really important that we're able just to kind of give you those uh, kind of insights in what we're seeing in, in the market, what we're seeing with the regulator. I'm not going to steal the thunder of anyone who's, who's coming next, but uh, what I would say is there's a lot of very, uh, very current and, and very relevant uh, information for you. So, um, you know, for those of us in Dublin, uh, maybe go out for a long drive this afternoon or a long cycle or whatever it is you want to do, because uh, certainly reading the tea leaves uh, would suggest we're going to be um, stuck here a little bit, a uh, little bit longer without a huge amount of, of activity. So hopefully you all manage to spend some time uh, in the summer out staycationing in Ireland somewhere um, and look, enjoy the session and hopefully you'll find it informative. Please ask questions along the way um, and uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, Darren, back to you. Thanks, Brian. And um, we're now going to open with our first session on board effectiveness in the virtual world for the, uh, Melissa Scully. Good morning. Thanks, Brian and Darren. And I'm really delighted to be here this morning to present to the group. And as Brian says, the way things are at the moment is here to stay. So I think what I'm going to talk about will hopefully be very topical and of interest to the group. Um, so what I'm going to cover is really look at board effectiveness in a virtual world. So firstly, I'm going to talk about what is an effective board, share some thoughts on regulatory areas of focus, and then move into some practical tips and guidance to think about as we go forward and how we can drive and maintain board effectiveness. So if we move on then, as I mentioned, the first thing I want to cover is really what is board effectiveness? And I think for this group in the investment management sector, the starting point for an effective board will be a clear understanding of the board's role and responsibilities. And that will vary depending on the type of company, whether it's a management company, investment firm, or indeed the type and structure of a fund. Alongside that, then when we talk about board effectiveness, we talk about a board having eight key enablers that help it to operate. And those are illustrated in the slide in front of you. So that's everything from an appropriate board composition, a board that is engaged both with the management team or the service providers. Um, it also understands its key stakeholders, that it's got the right governance structure in place, so the number and type of committees as appropriate, that it's also receiving clear agendas, the right management information to make decisions, and then importantly, that there's a strong leadership from the chair. What I would say, and I always say this when I talk about board effectiveness, is that ultimately it comes down to the quality of the people and the interactions between them. So those softer factors around dynamics, the level of challenge, that's all really important. And I think even more so as we move into the virtual world. So then if we look at the next slide, we've just touched on it. And sorry, if I can just ask if the slide can be great, thanks. So if we look at the next next slide what it really illustrates is the key areas of regulatory focus for boards and some of these are common themes that we're seeing across all financial services institutions but really to look at it from the investment management sector context 
So firstly, we are seeing more focus from the CBI in relation to governance structures and processes. And, and if we take one example, we can look at CPE6, where there's much more focus on organisational effectiveness and oversight of delegates and indeed substance. So that will continue to be a key area of focus. Looking at board effectiveness, again, something that the CBI is really interested in. And so everything from the diversity of the board and um, the robustness of board evaluation processes. So again, see, starting to see some more RMPs feature in this space. Culture and accountability is one of those key themes that is really permeating a lot of the supervisory responsibilities and something that we're going to see more push from the CBI on. Also alongside that, oversight of risk and control. And I think for the investment management sector, that will re be really important because we're seeing more focus on the amount of time boards are spending on risk management, oversight of outsourced providers, and really getting into understanding operational resilience. And then lastly, I couldn't talk about regulatory areas of focus and not mention ESG and sustainability, because it really is key. And you only have to look at both some of the messages we're now starting to see from both the central bank and European supervisory authorities, and as well as that key investors such as Larry Fink, the message is very clear. I think a lot of boards are now going to have to think about the impact of regulation and also then look at responsible investing and lots of other things within this space. So that really sets the scene. And what I want to talk about now is, given that all boards are operating mainly through video technology, what have we seen so far in this shift to the virtual world? And we've seen both the pros and cons of it. And I think if I take firstly the pros, I think what has been quite what I've been impressed with is the successful adaptation of technology by most boards. So most have moved to some form of video technology and it's generally working quite well for them with a few hiccups along the way. One surprising feature for some has been that there's been more efficient decision making. So things are being decisions are getting made faster and information's getting quicker. And I think that's that's been a positive and something that a lot of organisations, both at management and board level, have been reflecting on and been able to see governance as an enabler of decision making, which is great. We've seen chairs adapt their style to work their room and, and really lead board meetings in a slightly different way, which again has been a positive. And then lastly, I think one other key factor is we've seen reduced costs in travel, which for some directors might be making life a little bit easier. On the slip flip side, some of the key challenges that we've seen is that it has ultimately reduced the personal interactions both among, amongst the board, but as well as with um, key stakeholders or service providers that you might normally interact with when you walk the floor or you're on site for a board meeting. It also has, for many, increased the number of board and committee meetings, and that brings with it a little bit of video and meeting fatigue. There still are some improvements in technical proficiency. So we're all still trying to find our feet in the most effective way to use the technology. And then lastly, I would say that it has increased the burden on chairs in terms of both preparation and, and working behind the scenes to keep up to date and up to speed with everything. So that's a little bit about what we've seen so far. So then I think to really then reflect on that and have a think about, well, you know, what is a good and how can we be more effective in a virtual meeting? And it all starts with the preparation and that's really key. So for the chair and the company secretary and those supporting, it starts with having a really clear structured agenda that focuses on the key business of the board. So what we've seen are some boards are reducing complexity and they're removing items that can be covered perhaps in another manner, either via email or through an information session. As well as that, what's really important is to make sure that you're featuring enough breaks throughout the, the meeting, particularly if a, a meeting is going to be half a day, make sure that there's at least one short break. The quality of reporting and the prep of the presenters is also really key. So here we've seen chairs be more direct with, with management and service providers in terms of their expectations to make sure that cover sheets and reports are being really clear and signposting what is asked and required of the board. And as well, we've seen a slightly different shift in approach to how meetings, how presenters are attending and, and sharing their messages. So we've seen much more concise, tell us the top three to five issues we need to know and spending more time on the Q&A.
as well as that, and I, th I think another practical tip is to have some ground rules before a meeting that set out everything from what technology is to be used, some guidance, and some details around the etiquette of how things will work in the meeting, both for board members and presenters. Another tip I would share is that good room boardroom practices are becoming even more important now in the virtual world. So this is everything from making sure that people dial in beforehand to make sure that everyone can be heard, be seen, and also as well to think about legal requirements. Because one thing that's really important to call out is that the meeting location is by default under the Companies Act, where the majority of board members are, or if there is a, an even split, it's where the chair is. So I think that could, could potentially raise an issue for some boards and they need to be really mindful of that, both for revenue and, and tax purposes, but also coming back to my point around the CBI and their interest in substance and where decisions are being made. And then I think the last couple of points I will, will flag is that we are seeing more chairs being more active and I think that's really important, working the room more, using video to, to gauge when someone speaks and really asking people to contribute more if they feel some board members are being quieter than they would be in the normal circumstances. And then as well as that, I would encourage all board members to continue to challenge and also to make sure that that challenge is being clearly documented in the minutes. So then the last piece to me, uh, for me and what I want to finish off on is some thoughts on driving board effectiveness going forward. So there are a number of things that I would leave you with to think about. So the first thing I would say is monitor board effectiveness. Think about it and discuss it as a board on a regular basis, perhaps five, 10 minutes at the end of a meeting. How did that work? Could we do things differently? The second point is that it is harder to get time with stakeholders and we can't do it on a one-to-one -one basis. So make sure that you are still checking in. As well as that, I know from talking to board members, one thing that some miss is that personal connection, the, the opportunity to meet fellow board members through a dinner or coffee. So try and replicate it, meet in small groups if possible, also while following the, the relevant guidance. Another tip would be to reserve some meetings for the year ahead. So we do expect that boards will need to spend additional time as will audit committees. And as well as that, then one positive is now that we're all virtual, it is easier to bring experts and get other independent viewpoints into the room, either as part of a board meeting or a board training session. So I would encourage you to take advantage of that. And then the last point, and I've touched on this already, is really think about the quality of the information you're getting and make sure that there's a lot of focus in getting that right. So on that note, thank you for your time for listening and I hope you find that really useful. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks for the, that. Um, just before we move on to our next session, just to remind you that we will have time for questions at the end um, and the entire panel will come back. So please use the, the question functionality um, and, and I'll, I'll capture those questions then at the end. Um, moving on to our next session, um, which is being facilitated by Laura Wadding and Noel Comerford on cyber and financial crime. Thanks, Darren. I might clarify that this is being facilitated by Noel, and then and I'm just here uh, for fun, really. So um, I'm going to jump in at the end uh, with some comments around financial crime and um, some things, some important things that are happening there. But um, Noel really is going to lead this section and talk us through some of the latest uh, threat intelligence and some of the governance and, and uh, risk management considerations for asset management firms as well. Great. Thanks for that, Laura. Delighted to be here. So I think um, we can probably move on to the first slide. So I'm going to probably continue on from where Melissa left off in terms of board effectiveness, but <clears throat> specifically in relation to cyber risk. So I suppose to start off, I'd like to set the context and look at cyber, I suppose the cyber ecosystem as a business competitor. And what we do see in this space that like, I mean, the, the entire sort of collection of sort of cyber criminals or cyber malicious activity is quite has follows quite a very effective business model it operates off a global workforce it it relies on innovative and cutting edge tools which are widely and cheaply available so they're kind of a a low cost to entry into this marketplace they have very flexible business mo models and very responsive to market opportunities we've seen 
an alarming increase in the level of, I suppose, phishing and sort of business email compromise attacks since the pandemic started as they take advantage of the general lack of communication and confusion out there in the market of people that sort of are, were hungry for information and sort of their lives were disrupted and they sort of people shifted to remote working and more digital digital to technology. Um, it's very, it's vertically integrated across all industries. There's no sort of, um, it's completely business agnostic. It doesn't matter who you are, or what market segment you're in, they, they will basically, you are a target. Um, and at that, I suppose at that level, they're, they're embedded. I think um, they, they follow the value and anywhere they see they can extract value, that they'll chase that. It's very profitable. I think, that, as I said, there's low cost to entry and low overhead. I think the most, uh, the highest cost in the marketplace is the, just the cost of um, laundering the proceeds of the crime. Um, so I think putting that in the context, I think when we look at cyber as a competitor, which is actively trying to disrupt your own business, I think it has to be taken very seriously and possibly treated slightly differently to a normal business risk because it's continued to evolve and adapt and sort of actively target businesses and organizations in, in the marketplace, irrespective of their size. So that's just kind of set in the context around what we're up against, like in terms of their model. We move on to the next slide. We'll just look at maybe the different types of threat actors in terms of causes and effects. Um, now I've grouped them here into four, four key buckets really, I suppose, and where we see um, nation states and organized crime are probably the most sophisticated of, of the, the threat actors. And we do see, um, they're well resourced, well funded, and have plenty of time. Um, we do see there's a lot of crossover in terms of techniques and tools being used between nation states and organized crime. And sometimes nation states might imply organized crime figures and gangs to actually commit sort of cyber attacks to sort of give themselves some bit of distance on that one. Um, employers and employees, third parties, uh, it, like what we see is the, the insider threat, like I mean, they're constantly targeted as, as a weak point. Um, I said being inside the, being inside the inner circle means uh, this, the a level of controls might be lesser around that. So the um, impact in this space also include the disgruntled employees or sort of Accidents, accident, accident by employees. As the pace of change with digital enable, enablement continues to grow, I think we find that like, um, workforces are a little bit more stressed, a little bit more stretched. So there is potential there for employees to make genuine mistakes, which actually can put the business at hard uh, at harm. Um, contagion is a new, I suppose, a new bucket here. Um, it's kind of like third-party risk, but on a much wider scale, on the basis that as we're globally more interconnected, the, the, the chance of contagion from one industry to the next through very sophisticated and malicious software like is increasing. We've seen this quite um, radically over the last number of years, but with WannaCry and NotPetya, I think NotPetya had, like, had sort of devastating impact on some organizations with some costs running into the hundreds of millions to recover and respond to that, to that attack. Um, so that's kind of sort of the, the, the attack vectors, but I suppose the purpose of today's conversation is really look at sort of what can we do and how can we prevent those attackers eroding our business value. So if we just move on to the next slide, we'll see where we can look at this and what we can do. In terms of, and I kind of like this slide because it's sort of, it sets the context quite nicely. So in terms of taking action and what we can do as business leaders and what boards can do to address these issues, Really looking sort of on the far far left there at the top graph, so that in terms of attackers and their techniques, we've very little influence over that. There's very little we can do to change how they're going to attack or who's going to attack. Motivations are changing all the time. But I suppose what we can do in terms of at boards and the, the directors and stuff, what we can do is basically change our mindset. We can we have strong influence over what we can do within our own organiza organization and how we can respond to cyber threats. So if we look at the mindset, I think what we're focusing here is that it's time to start understanding cyber is not going anywhere. It's been, we, we kind of hoped over the last 15 years that we would get better at defending, but we do tend to see that we're not much, not much better off than we were 10, 15 years ago, as the tools and techniques increase in line with our response capabilities. So it's understanding the universal shift that cyber defense and, and risk, risk assessment in this space 
is going to is an embedded cost of doing business, especially if we want to play in the digital world. I think we have to prepare for and accept there's a level of uncertainty and testing around cyber. I mean, there's no such thing as a, a silver bullet or am I safe? I think when I started out, I think one of the things we said, if you want a truly secure computer, it's better to like, I mean, put it in a cement block and then drop it to the, the bottom of the ocean. And that's probably the only way you can keep it secure, but it's not much use to anyone at that level. I think we need continuing engagement and support across the business. So I think um, these things tend not to work without strong executive support. So I think the board gets a true understanding of the cyber risk and encourages open and transparent communication about what the risk is um, and avoid that culture of let's not bring bad news to the board's attention, let's tell them everything's green and cyber's okay and we're doing okay and we're, the investments are working. I think so. How do we do that? I think um, strong governance. I think we like again engage in open di dialogue, lead by example, be aware of the risks, understand what it is you're trying to protect. So what are the crown jewels within the business? What are the likely attack vectors? Do we have the right people? Do we have the right skills? Do we have the right investment? And are we getting the right information to support our decisions on that? So I think um, with those sort of things in place, we can start to address the issue and become a more resilient organization. I think when we're looking at resilience, I think it's about planning for outcomes, not causes. So looking at sort of whole services. So again, back to our crown jewels, what are our key services? What is the makeup of those services? And how do we protect them from cyber attack? And what controls can we put in place? And what's our risk appetite? I mean, I think uh, without understanding the scope of the problem, you run into sort of one of two problems. You either underinvest in trying to protect it or you overinvest. And I think we're trying to find a better balance in that. Uh, unfortunately, like um, in terms of, there, as I said, there is a level of uncertainty here, like quantification and accurate data around when an attack might occur or what an attack might do is not quite there yet. As we can't influence the attackers, so we don't have a great deal of quantification data. So we have to take a degree of uncertainty into, into that. Um, but we'll be focused on what our core business services are and understand how they're interconnected. We can then start to put in more effective controls and understanding. I think basically we have to be prepared to fail. So I think understanding what we can do if something, if the worst does happen and how we're gonna to respond to that and how we're gonna recover from that makes for a much more effective storytelling. I think we have to drive that sort of incident response culture into the organization and focus on what matters most. I think it's also important once these plans are in place, it's clear lines of accountability and responsibility and everyone understands their roles in the situation. And kind of most important that you test these plans and test it like at all levels of the organization from the, the operational risk layer right up to the exec and onto the board. So everyone understands where what can be done and how it's going to be done. So like I mean, the, the, the time for this is not you're in the middle of a crisis. I think that there, those issues can be stressful enough. So having that level of preparedness really does help focus the minds in that sort of space. And again, don't demand, demand better reporting. I think Melissa spoke about quality of reporting and I think um, there's far too much focus maybe on cyber metrics and cyber uh, technical issues and technical controls. I think we have, we we now in a position we should be demanding a little bit more intelligence around the type of reporting that's coming up to the board. So it put in more meaningful business context that can actually help us make those decisions and help us have that oversight and governance of, of the actual risk issue in line with what we're seeing from the regulation. And that's kind of the drive we're seeing from there as well. So we just, I suppose we can move on to the next slide and we look at what the, the CBI sort of thinks in this space. So we can see from, and I probably addressed a lot of these things as we, as we went through those last few slides, but we can see the thematic review the central bank conducted on sort of fund management areas. And it's going to, this was very similar to the thematic review they con uh, conducted on banks uh, a couple of years earlier. So we're seeing the same issues and the same sort of problems come true like across, across the board. So cyber risk governance, I think we've mentioned that. So this is a key area of influence that the board can drive. Um, basically cyber is, is as I said, it's a, it's a key critical risk and it should be treated as one. It should like, I mean, it could be, we have seen business ending events in the last few years and like companies have struggled to recover um, or have to invest significantly to recover. Um, 
IT asset inventories, I mean, I think there, there's a gap. People aren't looking at where their crown jewels are, what the criticality of the assets and how they're interconnected to deliver on the actual business model and the service being provided. Um, and the frequency of these reviews, I think it's probably not happened to the level that it needs to happen. Security event monitoring, again, we're talking about sort of the prepare and detect models will only take you so far. So I think it's basically looking at what we can do to understand our vulnerabilities and monitor our solutions. They're got a bit technical here and they said like they weren't really seeing mass deployment of security incident and event monitoring tools. I think uh, along with SOX, I think this is a, an area of um, increasing maturity within within industry, but it's probably not, there are some areas that are lagging behind. Um, at the SIEM and the SOC combination helps you to get a better a better view and to be able to look at systems and see if there's potential compromises occurring or help you investigate host and instance to find out how a compromise did occur. Again, with like cybersecurity risk management, correct metrics will provide a measure of reassurance, but I think we can go a little bit further than this. I think in terms of actually equating cyber metrics into business language and understanding the actual context so we can understand both where we're doing well and areas that might need a little bit of improvement and to encourage those open conversations again so we actually get realistic and robust information. And um, we spoke about the security incident management plan and sort of the frameworks that might be needed to put in place there. And as I said, testing is key on this. I think it's nice to be prepared and I've been through several critical incidents in my own career over the past 15 to 20 years and it is not a fun experience and having that sort of sense of preparedness and plan and a framework to follow does make things a lot easier and sort of keep people's stress levels and down and them to focus on actually getting the business back to where it needs to be to recover. Vulnerability management again they've sort of veered into more sort of technology here but I think it's important that once we understand what we're trying to protect we do try and identify the weaknesses and controls and and what the impact of that might be. So I think um, better or more adequate vulnerability management in terms of maybe just understanding how we maintain critical systems and how we assess them for vulnerabilities and how our controls that we have put in place actually reduce the vulnerability, therefore reducing the risk and the probability of an incident occurring. And basically we invest a little bit of time and effort uh, and sort of funds in, in terms of being able to detect in the issues within our systems. So that kind of ties back into that sort of seam and sock and sort of preparedness level. And I think um, I think if we, we can address these sort of six areas, we can go a long way towards reducing the attack factors and kind of starving that sort of cyber business model to the point where we may get on top of it. I think I'll bring Laura in and see if there's any comments here on that. Thanks, Noel. Thanks a lot. Um, I think maybe just to just to touch on a couple of points, probably uh, within the asset management sector, you know, the, the actual operating model, um, more often than not, places some reliance on the group infrastructure within the organization. Um, and, you know, we've got big named firms authorized here, um, but the size of the Irish office might be small if by comparison to the rest of the organization. Like some of the feedback we get is really around how how can firms leverage um, the group infrastructure to manage cyber risk? And we're generally of the view that, that it's fine to do that, provided that the board of the Irish entity are able to articulate on question by the central bank um, how that actually works in practice, and that there's sufficient reporting uh, provided to the Irish entity to demonstrate that those risks and that governance is in place. And also more and more we're, we're seeing an expectation that the Irish legal entity as authorised here would have uh, a policy in place that would that would um, sort of demonstrate and, and articulate uh, how this all ties together and how the how the board of the Irish entity um, manages its risk. Um, the other thing to mention, because this cyber for me uh, is a really interesting topic because it is a real risk it is uh, very closely linked to financial crime um, and um, it should form part of any organization's risk management framework and, and you know 
whilst I'm not an expert on cyber risk, um, I have spent a lot of time advising firms, boards and, and their executive teams on risk management um, and risk management frameworks and how to implement them. So there is, there are tools and techniques that a firm can use to manage cyber risk as part of its non-financial risk framework. I think it's important to note that too. Um, and the other thing to mention is that, and, and I hear this all the time, you know, that an organization is only as strong as its weakest link. So the size, and Noel, you alluded to it at the outset, actually the size of the firm is kind of irrelevant. If if the, if the there's a, vulnerabil a vulnerability um, in one part of the firm, then, you know, that, that can be enough to, to create, um, to create a challenge if there is an attack. So, so there were some of my thoughts just around the management of cyber risk and a growing expectation uh, from the regulator, not just here, but within Europe, that boards of financial institutions have a good handle on this. Um, we're going to just touch on AML just for a couple of minutes. Uh, there's some, I think it's exciting, but but then, you know, I'm a bit of an AML nerd. Um, so so currently in Europe, uh, there's there's a whole lot going on with regard to the development of legislation and policy and um, and the supervision of financial institutions. And there's a bit of a mixed bag there in terms of the role of the European supervisory authorities, the EBA for banking, ESMA for investment management and EOPA for insurance. And they cross over quite a bit in the context of AML and they develop. Um, you know, the ESA's guidance, which is directly applicable here, and the central bank has been vocal about that in the past. So, so we get policy from Europe and we get guidance from Europe today. And um, banks are used, uh, significant banks are used to having um, a, a single supervisory mechanism in place as well. So they'll be supervised at a European level for lots of their activity. But typically, anti money laundering. Um, obligations are supervised by the local uh, domestic authority, which here obviously is the central bank. Um, so, so there's a change being proposed at a European level that many of you will have heard about. Um, so if we move on, I just want to run through uh, what that change, um, what, what what's being proposed and the potential impact on this sector. Um, so, so there's a European, an AML uh, EU framework, an action plan, which uh, seeking to introduce a unified approach to anti-money laundering uh, policy setting and supervision. Um, so it means that rules will be set at an EU level and they will be directly applicable here. And that, that kind of happens in, in practice today anyway, but it will be more formal. Um, the, there would also be a greater level of sharing of information between financial intelligence units. And whilst that's encouraged today, it's not always effective. Um, and there are limitations with regard to what the FIU in Ireland can send uh, cross border, et cetera. And also in terms of, and we've seen some really good practice in this in Europe in the last um, few months, in terms of actually taking proactive approach to monitor uh, transaction activity um, at an industry level or at a, um, at a geographical level, then, then this might facilitate a bit more of that in terms of uh, FIUs working together to identify suspicious activity and to identify the movement of um, illicit funds across Europe. Um, so I think that's a, a really interesting development. Um, the, the other thing that's probably the one that's causing the most controversy for, the, for everybody actually is the concept of a single supervisor for anti-money laundering in Europe. And the European Banking Authority had put their hand up to say they're really supportive of this and, and um, there are early indications that they may be selected as the single supervisor. And effectively, that means that um, if that goes ahead, um, and it might not, there, there might be an independent uh, body established to actually be the supervisor. Um, but one way or the other, effectively firms in based in Ireland will ultimately be supervised at a European level. And um, there are advantages to that in terms of consistency of information that's provided to firms, consistency of requests for information and in the outcome of uh, inspections. Um, but then there are challenges with regard to applying, you know, the thinking around banking to the investment management sector or to the insurance sector. Um, initially, you know, when, when this entity is getting set up, there could be a challenge in, in knowledge uh, at a sectoral level. Uh, if the entity, for example, like the EBA, um, hasn't spent a lot of time supervising 
investment firms. So, so I do think there are some challenges at that at that level. Um, we're keeping a watching brief on this. Um, it brings lots of different opportunities for Ireland and for the sector, um, but but notwithstanding, it also brings some challenges. And I think um, on the basis that the central bank has been very active in this space and has a really well established anti money laundering supervisory team uh, and are really well versed in, in what they're doing. Um, I would like to see them being part of the solution and I expect that they probably will uh, in the end. Um, so, so that's really all I wanted to cover off there. I know we're going to probably go back to Darren for a sec before we move on with the, the rest of this morning's agenda. Thanks very much, Laura. Yes, one, one final session to, to run through, which is just an introduction to IFR and IFD. Uh, and Lachlan is going to take us through that now before we open up to the panel. Thank you. Yep, thanks, Darren. Um, thanks, Laura. Um, so, yeah, so what I want to uh, run through today is just to give you like a high level introduction to the, the new regulation, the new investment firm regulation and directive um, that is coming into effect in June 2021. Um, so, first of all, we look at who's in scope, um, give a bit of background as to why it's been introduced in the first place, um, and then I'll outline some of the kind of key considerations that. Um, that you need to be kind of mindful of the key impacts of the investment firm regulation and directive on the firms themselves. And um, so to start, um, who's in scope? Um, well, all investment firms that are authorised and supervised under MIFID are in scope for the IF4 or IFD. Um, so firms authorised under the USITS or the AIFM um, directives are not in scope, um, although there are some changes to those directives as a result of the IF4. Um, in terms of the minimum own funds requirements for those firms. Um, so the IFD changes some of the UCITS and the AIF um, directives with regards to own funds in that the minimum now must be at least um, the same as the fixed overheads requirements, which is one quarter of the preceding year's um, fixed overheads. So there's some changes to the UCITS and AIFM firms, um, but they're largely out of scope for everything else in the IF4. Um, so the question is then kind of in terms of setting the scene of why the IF4 or IFD has been brought in at all. So what's the rationale for it? Um, well, essentially, there was a kind of a recognition really that the, the CRO or CRD, which um, was the basis for the kind of capital requirements for investment firms, is too heavily bank focused and didn't really kind of address appropriately the kind of the, the idiosyncratic risks um, that are inherent to investment firms and didn't really take account of the fact that there's such a a diversity of investment firm um, business models. So, and this is kind of clear when when you see all the various different exemptions and waivers and derogations that are available to investment firms under the CRO. Um, it's quite clear that it's not really kind of fit for purpose for the actual investment firm universe. So, the idea that um, instead of deriving the prudential and capital requirements for investment firms from the CRO. Instead of doing that, they recognise the need to develop a new kind of more appropriate and proportionate um, regime for investment firms um, and to try and better align that regime then to the various different investment firm business model risks that are generated through the activities um, that they undertake. Um, so the result of that is this IFR, IFD. Um, and what it tries to do really is to strike the balance then between the safety and soundness of investment firms um, but also avoiding then excessive costs that might kind of undermine the the, um, the viability of the um, the business activities that the investment firms undertake. Um, so we can move on now to see like what are the actual what are the key changes, what are the key impacts. So the first major impact um, is on the categorisation. So what the IFR does is it introduces an entirely new way of categorising investment firms. So all of the existing categories, the CRD exempt, the FOR, all of those are, are, are removed and they're all replaced with this new four-step um, categorization. Um, so the class one firms um, are essentially the largest, most systemically important, most bank-like firms. Um, so these are firms that would deal on own account, they underwrite on firm commitment basis, and they have total assets, um, balance sheet size of greater than 30 billion euros. So once you get over that threshold, um, these firms will be required to um, apply for authorization as a credit institution, um, and they will be subject then to the full CRR, full CRD 
um, and will then fall into scope for supervision by the ECB, the, the single supervisory mechanism, um, the SSM. So that's the class one. Below that, then we have the class one minus firms. Um, so these are still the very large firms. Um, in some jurisdictions, they refer to them as class one A or class one B, but the CBI terminology is the class one minus is what we've been using. Um, so these are not necessarily systemically important firms, but they're still operating at a scale um, that is sufficient to require them to be supervised um, in the same way as banks. But there's a recognition that, <clears throat> excuse me, that the activities or the business isn't necessarily appropriate for them to be required to become credit institutions. Um, so the threshold here was set at 15 billion. So once you're over 15 billion, um, but below 30, um, then you do not need to become a credit institution. So you're still authorized as a MIFID investment firm, but you will be subject to the same prudential treatment as credit institutions, i.e. you will be subjected to the full CRR um, and the full CRD. So any of the kind of waivers and exemptions that were available currently to investment firms under CRR or CRD will fall away. Um, so that's the class one and class one minus. And then if we go to the other extreme, the class threes, these are the smallest, lowest risk firms. So firms that don't trade on own account, don't hold client money or safeguard assets, um, or don't engage in any of the higher risk activities. Um, so there are various thresholds here for the class three firms um, that must be maintained to to fulfill the criteria for class three. So none of those activities, the assets under management must be under a certain threshold of 1.2 billion. The number of client orders handled has to be under a certain level, the balance sheet size limits. So the various thresholds that class three firms must remain um, under. And once you exceed those thresholds, you're no longer class three. Um, but once you stay below that, you're a class three firm. And they're subject to a kind of a slightly reduced IFO or IFD. So they, the kind of proportionality of the IFR comes in really in the application across class three and class two firms. Um, so the class two firms then are basically everybody else. So if you're not a class one or class one minus, um, but you're not a class three, you're a class two firm and you're subject to the full IFR and IFD. Um, so any firm that's less than 15 billion in assets or balance sheet, but does hold client money or does administer and safeguard assets, then um, they'll be a class two firm. Um, and so they'll be subject to the full IF4 or IFT. So the first instance, the questions that people need to be thinking about, especially on the board level, is you know, well, where where do we fit in? What's our where do we fall in the spectrum um, between the class one and the class three? Um, and once that's determined, then you can then figure out okay, what's the impact of that. So if we move on, we can see then the the the, the main impact for the the class two and class three firms. We can ignore the class one and class one minus for now because. Obviously, they're subject to CRR or CRD, um, so the impact of IF or IFT isn't really relevant to them for the purposes of today's discussion. So, um, so the chief impact here then is in this new concept of what are called K factors. Um, so, what the IF or does is it sets out it's essentially a brand new approach to how to calculate um, the capital requirement for investment firms. And it, as we spoke earlier, the idea is to align it to the business activities that the firm undertakes. Um, so depending on what kind of risk-based activities the firm undertakes, then there's a different K factor for each one. And then there's a calculation to determine how much capital to be held based on those activities. Um, so this is kind of a more tailored um, and viewed as a more appropriate approach um, to kind of to set the minimum capital requirement for these firms. So the investment firms only need to apply the relevant K factors based off their, um, their business model. So this kind of, this helps to set a kind of a, a level playing field or enable a consistent approach from supervisors so that investment firms that are engaging in similar activities um, are treated the same way and have similar kind of capital requirements. Um, so we can kind of run through the, the idea of the K factors are kind of they're grouped into three broad risk categories. So we have a risk to client. Um, so this is determined by the amount of assets under management, um, the amount of client money held, uh, the number of assets safeguarded, administered, and the number of client orders handled. So all of those metrics um, are used to calculate in a very simple kind of formula. You know, it's the value per metric, and then there's a coefficient to multiply, and then that gives you the capital requirement for for those uh, K factors. Um, then there's the risk to market. So that depending on the activities of the firm. So if you have a trading book, then there'll be a risk to market. And then this is essentially in here, the K factor is the NPO or net position risk. Um, and 
the requirement under I4 doesn't really change from the CRR. So the investment firm still has to manage it in accordance with the CRR. So whether it's you know standardized or alternative standardized approach, um, it's still the same under this, but now it's just that number now becomes the K factor for uh, for market risk. Um, and then the third group is the risk to firm. So then this is kind of based off the daily trading flow, which is the, the number of the, the orders that the firm engages in its own name, even if it's on behalf of a client, but the orders executed in the name of the investor firm itself. Um, trading counterparty default, the TCD K factor. So that's similar. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of a similar simplified provision based off the counterparty credit risk under CRR. So it's similar, but you know, slightly simplified for the purposes of the investment firms. And then concentration risk, which again is similar to the existing CRR um, uh, large exposure provisions. So the idea with these K factors is that they're, they can mirror what is in existence already for a lot of the CRR requirements, but they're slightly simplified. And the idea is to kind of make it a bit easier for the firms to, um, to, uh, to monitor and to, to calculate. Um, but for the firms themselves now, what, what the firms need to figure out is, okay, well, which K factors are relevant for us? Um, do we have the appropriate data quality to actually to, to monitor these and to perform the calculations? Do we have the infrastructure available to then put it all together um, and to, you know, to reconcile the, the, um, all the, 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 the capital requirements? Um, and then the ability to actually report all this. So the important thing to note here is the class two firms need to do this. Um, the class three firms, the capital requirement isn't based off K factors because of the recognition that they don't do a lot of those riskier activities, um, but they still need to be able to monitor the K factors to be able to demonstrate that they still comply with the criteria for being a class three. So even though it doesn't impact their capital calculation, um, it is a requirement that they're able to actually demonstrate what these levels are. So then they, that they're still a class three. So from a, from a class two firm as a board, you'd want to know well, what K factors are appropriate for us, what's in scope, and also then what is the impact of this? You know, how does this K factor capital calculation, what's the difference between what our current capital requirements are and what's it likely to be under K factors? And then what's our approach to, to dealing with that? Um, so then, the next kind of impact is on the reporting. So obviously capital calculation is a big one, um, but the next is on the reporting side. And this is kind of important when we think, uh, if we want to move on to, yeah, um, to the next slide. Um, when we see some of the action from the CBI in the recent past in terms of um, sanctions and fines on the basis of misreporting, um, I think this is kind of, it's important to to get this, this one right. So the idea is that there's, a slightly more proportionate approach again to reporting. Um, but again, that is generally dealt with by giving class three firms a bit more um, latitude in terms of the, the frequency of reporting. So a lot of the detail of what needs to be reported is still being kind of figured out through the level two text um, from the EBA. But essentially what needs to be reported is kind of it's on the screen there. Um, so the composition of own funds, the requirements, the calculations that led to the that requirement um the, the reporting the actual activities for those class three thresholds to make sure that you're still either a class two or a class three and then other things like concentration risk and liquidity requirements so because a lot of these concepts are new like the k factors and concentration risk would be new for some firms um it's important then that the infrastructure is in place to actually deal with all this new reporting requirement um so kind of you know where where is the firm now in this kind of journey to integrate these new reporting requirements, these new templates, the whole new suite of reporting templates that will be coming from the regulator? Where is the firm in this journey to actually get all those implemented um, in time? So um, also just want to point out, even the class one and class one minus firms will have reporting requirements here um, because they have to obviously verify that they're still class one or class one minus and that haven't fallen down into the class twos. So even though they're largely under CRR or under the IFR, they still have some reporting requirements here um, on, a, on a quarterly basis to the NCA. So these reporting requirements here for class two firms will be quarterly for the class threes. It's an annual thing. Um, but again, so the, the, the kind of the, the consideration here is really to bear in mind, you know, where, how well advanced are we in terms of actually implementing these and delivering on these um, reporting requirements. Um, 
And so then the last piece I wanted to touch on today um, in terms of what the I4 brings in is in terms of remuneration. So what the I4 does is it brings in a lot of the same um, core kind of principles that the CRR has for remuneration um, and brings them into the I4 and IFT. So again, important to note the class three firms are exempt from this. So they don't have um, these remuneration requirements, but the class two firms do. So what the class two firms need to do now, well, some class two firms will have exemptions, but in general, what they need to do is make sure obviously the whole idea of the remuneration policy, um, it kind of, it does, it, it facilitates, you know, um, kind of risk management, um, effective risk management. And under the CRR, obviously there's a bonus cap within the CRR. Um, the IFR does not bring in a bonus cap. Um, but what it does do is it requires these firms to set an appropriate ratio is how it's described. Um, so it kind of is letting the firms themselves determine what that is. Um, so having clearly identified the difference between variable and fixed comp compensation, um, then the firms need to set an appropriate ratio between those two. Um, and so this is something that will be very new for a lot of the class two firms. Um, and the difficulty here might be is actually is demonstrating to the, the regulator why this appropriate ratio is actually appropriate. Um, so these are kind of considerations that need to be kind of thought of now. Um, and then the other one the major kind of change here is that there's also a requirement now that all remuneration policies and practices be gender neutral. Um, gender neutral isn't necessarily defined within the regulation, but um, it is something that is a requirement here. So the firms will need to really kind of assess their current remuneration practices um, and policies to determine whether or not there is potential issues uh, within them and what kind of remediation plan you might have to address them. Because under the pillar three disclosures for class two, um, the remuneration, things like uh, risk management and loan funds, pillar three disclosures are there, but also gender pay gap disclosure is part of the pillar three requirements now for class two firms. So they're kind of a, some of the changes that are coming through in the remuneration side. Um, so I think to kind of summarize it all together in terms of what, what you really need to be thinking about is kind of um, number one, where do we fall? What's, what categorization does our firm fall into? Um, then what key factors are going to be in scope? What's the impact on capital? Um, what's the impact in the reporting? Do we have the infrastructure in place to actually deal with the new reporting? You know, what kind of solution have we devised to, to implement all this? Um, and then again, in terms of the remuneration side, assessing the policies that are in place to see you know, where, um, where there's potential issues and then what kind of remediation plan is in place to address them. Um, so that was a very quick whistle stop tour of the I4 IFD. Um, so I will stop there and hand back to Darren, um, but happy to take any questions then through the chat um, afterwards. Thanks, Lachlan. Um, I am slightly conscious of time. I really am keen to to get everyone off at eleven in in line with them um, with the schedule. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here to to share with the panel. Um, so I'll run through those those quite quickly. I'm sure we won't be able to get to them all, um, but we'll certainly try and, and, and follow up on on any ones we don't get to. Um, firstly, Melissa, I might go to yourself. Um, just in relation to the uh, impact of the CP86 re review, um, anything sort of impact or the expectations on the boards of, of management companies? Yeah, Darren, a very good question. So I think the point around substance and the number of resources in place and number of days, it will be critical that the board is looking at that. I know, Laura, you've been doing a bit of work in this space, so you might have some thoughts to share. Yeah, so, I mean, Darren, I think there's good practice, you know, that Melissa has outlined and, and that's that's um, sector agnostic, you know, it's good practice for boards and, and it helps to bring about board effectiveness. I do think that the out, the outcome of the central bank's review of, of compliance with the fund management company guidance, I think it will be impactful and I think that it is supported by a view from Europe around um, substance as well. So. Um, and that does have an impact on the expectations in terms of how the board is organised, how the firm is managed, uh, and the two things kind of go hand in hand. So 
Um, I think there will be, I think there will be an impact uh, and a change in um, expectations over the next couple of years for sure. And I think the sector is pretty aware of that as well. And and just just one other point, if I can stick with yourself, Melissa, um, just in and around you, and you touched on uh, culture. Um, obviously, there's challenges around that in this environment and and the remote working, etc. Is any tips for for the board specifically on on that area? I think really two tips, Darren, and I think one is to make sure that it is on the board's agenda and that they're thinking about the metrics that could be culture indicators and maybe suggest any changes. So I think really be very focused on it. And then I think another is what I mentioned earlier around checking in, you know, so I think it is more challenging when you can't have the same FaceTime or personal interactions, but just make sure that there are those touch points as well. Thanks very much. Again, just conscious of the time. And uh, Noah, I might just come to you with a quick quick question. Um, on the subject of um, good cyber practice, have you any recommendations on platforms to share information of cyber incidents? Um, that's that's a very that's an excellent question. I think it's again it's a an area that's quite immature. Um, there are there are tools out there for sharing information. Most organisations are reluctant to share information, so it's about finding a trusted model. There's been various European approach to try and do this over the years but there are for, for financial services there is the information sharing communities like the fs isac and if you want to look that up i think that's that's um they all tend to follow sort of chatham house rules and there is kind of a, an onboarding procedure to like to become a trusted member so you can share that information certainly you can do it informally between sort of um groups within your own sector or so they within sort of other organizations that maybe non-compete that you feel comfortable with but it's about building that trust, I think, is the key thing, and then determining what you want to share and how you want to share. At a technical level, there are certainly schemes like Sticks and Taxi on how to share technical threat information, all the rest between mach like machine to machine. But at that uh, above that, it is it is about building trust. But there are communities out there, so it's basically look to your sector and sort of see which community suits you best. Thanks, Noel. Um, and, and just one other one, Noel, um, just in relation to the, the independent directors um, particularly, um, any specific advice on the questions they should be asking? Obviously, in the investment management context, that they would have a lot of service providers, um, you know, admins, custodians, et cetera, um, while they sit on the boards of, of the individual funds themselves. Yeah, I suppose the independent director, we've seen the biggest drive for security improvements in the last few years have been driven at a board level, has been done through independent directors and having that visibility and just asking those questions. So it's about, it's like, I mean, asking what are we doing with cyber? Have we addressed, do we understand the risk for our organisation and our value and how are we dealing with it? I think the ones who like those sort of three key questions are the, are the, are the most important i think and also independent directors uh, also have maybe an opportunity to be that cyber champion on the board without having another portfolio so they can actually be the voice of reason or sort of ask those questions and make sure the information does flow up and actually the governance does flow down thanks no um moving on uh lachlan just to just to specific specific question here um does ifo and ifd apply to fund management companies with mifid add-ons um no the it's it's based off the actual the authorization so if it's authorized under aif md or usage then they're not in scope um but there is the, it can be a bit tricky to figure out exactly what the requirements would be for those activities because the idea is the regulators want regulatory arbitrage whereby a firm that's performing MIFID activities without the MIFID authorization necessarily shouldn't be treated um, more, advantageously, more advantageously than a MIFID investment firm that's engaged in the same activities. So the idea that the, the, kind of the, the capital requirement for those activities, there will be some kind of, there will be a requirement to kind of make sure that the, the capital requirements for those activities um, are set at appropriate level to each other. So while they're not necessarily in scope, I think the actual the capital requirement for the MIFID add-ons, um, the process for that will, will probably have to change. <laughs>
Thanks, Lachlan. I've, I have another question coming in here and, and slightly circling back. Um, would the panel concur that the outcome of the CP86 review may be shaped by the upcoming release of the Commission consultation at the end of September? Or will the tone of recent ESMA AIFMD letter be influential to the CBI sentiment? I know who asked that question as well. <laughs> <laughs> So I mean I have I have I have a view on this. Um I don't know if I don't know if we'll concur, but um certainly I would say that the um it there's a bit of the central bank has probably been influential in uh on the ESMA side of things through um you know in the in an attempt to uh, achieve supervisory convergence and uh, I certainly think that they will be um driven forward by ESMA um as ESMA proposals in this regard uh, and I think that the central bank's position will be strengthened by that for sure so there, there is a connection between the two and um, it will influence the outcome I would imagine. Thanks Thora. One final question um, before we close and, and apologies and I, I appreciate it. I'm a couple of minutes over but please bear with us. Um, no, just in relation to the move to uh, working remotely that's happened uh, across, obviously, all industries, um, well, not all industry, but a significant number of industries, but particularly in the financial services side, any additional cyber risks coming from that, or have you seen any uh, anything um, related specifically to that? Yeah, well, I suppose there's two or three key risks that like, I mean, have been introduced with the, I suppose, increased remote working. We've always, I suppose, most organizations have always had remote working at some level. Yeah. I think it's basically the disruption to employees' day day to day lives has made them more susceptible to a phishing attack and sort of that sort of news. So I think um, making sure your employees have a, a a level of awareness around the threat and phishing emails and stuff is a kind of a key risk. The for companies to have adapted very quickly, maybe the actual technology they're using to provide remote access might need to be just assessed to make sure it's robust and resilient to an external attack, just to keep it like, make sure that it's not a, a sort of a new way into your organization. And I suppose the, other, the next kind of key risk is, do we know where all our data is now? I think with everyone working from home, are we actually shipping data from what we're supposed to, the, the central organization out to the edge through the true remote working? Do we have control over those end to use our endpoint devices? I think some organizations didn't really have that much laptop, didn't have this is like a same stock of laptops to say a company like Deloitte might have had. So they basically use it for going out and buying their own laptops and being allowed to connect back. So it's just basically have we still got control of the endpoint and are we still protecting the endpoint and therefore protecting our staff? Thank you, Noel. Um I don't see any um any other questions coming through at the moment, so I might take that opportunity just to thank all our speakers today, uh, Laura Wadding, Noel Comerford, Melissa Scully, and Lachlan O'Connor. So thank you very much for, for, for your time this morning. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended. We hope you got something uh, something out of the session. We will be sharing the slides um, in, in a follow-up communication with you all. So I'll leave it there. Thank you again. Enjoy the rest Thanks, of your morning. Sir. Thanks, everyone.